Good morning, everyone. It's really good to be here again. I hope you're having a great Sunday so far. Um, I'm really excited to be here and worship with you guys. This is my house. Just kidding. Um, I'm at the Douglas's house, but I'm really happy to be here worshiping with you guys this week. Let's praise God together. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God is never late. It's working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I Welcome to Olivet Baptist Church. We want to take this time to welcome you to our online service this morning. You know, the Bible tells us that in Psalm 100, 4 and 5, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever to all generations. When we read this scripture, it's like that one does not even have to guess what kind of attitude we need to have when we enter into the house of the Lord. Now today is a little bit different, just like the last couple of weeks that we've gathered together. It's all different, but we can gather together in his name. Even though we're still worshiping here in our homes, we all have to join our hearts and our minds to one central purpose, entering into his courts with thanksgiving and praise. Again, Welcome to Olivet Baptist Church, and let's continue to worship our God together.
there with us. I think you, because it could be in the middle of a fire, it could be in the middle of the ocean, but you're still there with us and you're still holding our hands and you, um, you were not caught by surprise by any of that. I just thank you for who you are and for how great you are. I thank you because you are here in the midst, in the midst of everything. I thank you because you're still working in our lives regardless of everything. I just, I just have reasons to thank you today. Just be with us. Keep showing us your glory, your mercy, your love. Keep showing us who you are. And we worship you for that.
OBC. Uh, I, I'm so glad to meet with you again. I can't tell you how much uh, I miss not being able to gather together. Uh, I tell you, we uh, are looking forward to hopefully uh, within the next couple of weeks, maybe being able to gather together. We want to do it safely and with social distancing. And so I hope you'll pray for the staff as we uh, talk to you know, city officials and the CDC uh, as they give input. Uh, we want to make really um, wise decisions and safe decisions. But uh, hopefully it won't be long till we can gather together uh, in some form or fashion. But uh, I tell you, uh, I appreciate your faithfulness. I hope you're gathered as a family, as uh, we worship together. I so appreciate uh, our, our worship teams that have done such a good job uh, during this time. And so we're, we're just uh, excited that we can meet in this way. But if you do have your Bibles this morning, if you would open them to Philippians chapter 1, uh, we're going to continue our study of the book of Philippians. You know, Brian Harbour uh, tells the story of this young, rising business executive in New York City. In fact, he was actually waiting at a subway station on his way into the city. And I mean, he was dressed for success. And I mean big time. He's wearing like a $1,200 suit. He's wearing $350 pair of alligator shoes. He has a $500 attache case that he's carrying. He has a pipe sitting out the side of his mouth. And you know, the truth was this young man was a mover and he was a shaker and he knew it and he wanted everyone to look at him would know that he is a mover and a shaker. Well, there was another man that boarded the subway at the very first station. Now he had been sick all night. He was having a hard time holding his breakfast down. And as the subway stopped at each new stop and new station, people began to get on the subway. And all of a sudden, with the people there, it was becoming more packed, the, the heat was rising, the closeness of people being together, it began to make him more and more nauseous. And he was overwhelmed with uh, the feeling of being sick. And so with one hand over his mouth, he used the other to fight through the crowd to make his way to the door. And in the meantime, the car stopped. The subway stopped at the station right where this rising young executive was waiting to get on the subway. Well, just as the door opened, this sick man reached the door and just to put it as nicely as possible, he lost all of his breakfast all over this young executive. I mean all over his $1,200 suit, his $500 pair of alligator shoes, you know, his, his uh, uh, you know, $500 attache case and the nice shoes that he had. And I mean, he lost it and immediately the door slammed, the subway moved on toward the next stop to make its way into the city. And as the passenger looked out the window towards this young executive still standing at the station there, totally shocked, he could read this guy's lips as he was saying, why me? Why me? Now, I, I think at some level we can probably all identify with that story because we've all had those kind of why me kind of days, you know, why is this happening to me? And, you know, sometimes it even brings up this bigger picture of, well, why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, why, why does it go this way? And if there is a God, we certainly know that these bad things are happening. Why would he allow them to happen? Now, this really is a very big question. And the question becomes, well, how should we think about that? How, how should we feel about that? 
How should we respond to that? Well, we're in a series in the book of Philippians, and it is written by the Apostle Paul in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of a trial, and, and make no mistake about it. I mean, this was one of those why me kind of crisis that you would face in life. In fact, Paul was in chains. He is in prison and he is there because of his faith in Jesus. Literally, he's there because he's right in the center of God's will for his life. And yet he is in chains. Now, Paul is considered by many, not just the greatest apostle, but he is considered by many the most influential of the apostles. I would argue that he is the greatest missionary that has ever lived. In fact, he founded church after church in city after city. As if that is not enough, we know that God used the apostle Paul to write most of the New Testament. In fact, he is writing the words that we're going to read He's writing them to a group of believers in Philippi, and he's writing them while he is in prison and while he is in chains. So here becomes the big question. What was Paul's perspective about bad things happening to godly people? In other words, how did he view the problem of evil and suffering? See, listen, I, I don't want you to miss this today. It, it's so important. I think there are many followers of Jesus that are absolutely blown away by trials, by crisis, by difficulty, because they don't have a biblical perspective. And so the question is this, how do I view the trials of life, the crisis in life? What is a proper perspective? And we're gonna learn this from Paul. The first question I want us to think about is, well, how do I view my circumstances? How, how do I view those circumstances? Well, notice what he says here, beginning in verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. Now, it's interesting here that Paul is writing to these other followers of Jesus about how a Christian should respond when adversity strikes. In fact, notice verse 12, again on your outline, he said, listen, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute because to me, that is a remarkable statement that Paul makes. Uh, in other words, Paul is in prison because of his faith. He is in chains, he is in Rome. I mean, now what we know is this, if you were in Roman custody, there were really four possibilities about your situation. Number one, you could have been imprisoned with or without chains. Secondly, you could have been in military custody. In other words, you would have been chained to a soldier. Thirdly, you could have been released into the custody of a trustworthy person. Or fourth, you could have been released on your own reconnaissance. Now, notice again what he said here in verse 13. He said, so that it, it, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Now notice he talks about the imperial guard, sometimes called the Praetorian guard. That this is literally the Roman elite guard. It's uh, stationed in, in Rome. And so get the picture here. What he's saying is for 24 hours a day, one after another, these select soldiers were chained to the Apostle Paul and they were forced to be with him. Now, what we know is again, these were elite soldiers. They were not known as moral upstanding human beings. I mean, you know, these were, you know, pagan, they were godless, uh, they were the worst of the worst. 
In fact, Ignatius, a Christian of the second century, wrote of his own imprisonment while, <clears throat> while on the way to execution. He said that he was chained to these imperial guards night and day. And he said it was like being chained to wild beasts who became worse when they were treated well. Now think about this. So, so what does Paul put really on his uh, uh, social media post about this situation. I think it's interesting what he does. First of all, he says, well, it's good for the palace guards because those who are imprisoned, he said, are seeing that my chains are because of my faith in Jesus. Now I thought about this this week. Could you imagine being chained to the apostle Paul 24 seven? I mean, I thought of it in these terms. I think the truth is Paul wasn't chained up. These Praetorian guards were chained up. I mean, basically what's happened, they're with Paul eight hours at a time. And so what's happening is Paul is laying the gospel on these men eight hour shifts at a time. I mean, think of it this way. If Paul would have come to Rome as an evangelist and they would have had a big crusade at the Roman Colosseum, I mean, the fact is none of these guys would have been, you know, that you couldn't have got them out of the, the bars long enough or the brothel houses long enough to come and hear Paul preach. And yet they're chained to him and Paul is sharing the gospel with them. In fact, by the way, historians tell us that the gospel got into these elite guards. In other words, there were many that eventually came to Christ and from what we know, this is where it began. Now, Paul says it even gets better. He said, not only are these men hearing the gospel, but other believers are being challenged by Paul's chains to be more bold in the faith. In other words, think of it. Paul's saying the believers who had been on the sidelines, the believers who just kind of sat on the bench, the believers who just kind of stayed in the shadows, when they began to hear of Paul's chains for the gospel, many of them became more bold in their faith. They had more courage to share about Jesus. You know, and so for Paul, this was a win. You know, as, as I read this text this week, the thought hit me that in all of these words that we read, there is not a single word to elicit personal sympathy towards Paul. I, to me, that, that was really profound because the circumstances were not good, but Paul was saying, God is using these circumstances for good. I, I mean, think of it this way. Instead of asking, why do bad things happen to good people? I think the real question is, what should a godly person's attitude be when bad things happen? You know, the cultural argument today is, well, we rush in and what we say is, well, bad God for letting this happen, letting this circumstance happen. Now, Clay Jones in his book, you know, Why God Allows Evil, I think makes a very strong case that when you look at history, it's really not bad God, but the bigger question is bad people because humanity has been at the root of much of the evil that we face. But what if it isn't bad God at all? I mean, what if it is a very good God who even when bad things happen is bringing good out of it? In fact, maybe even more good that outweighs the bad. Now, when you read this text, you can almost feel Paul's energy. I mean, you really can feel this excitement. He's fired up about what is happening as a result of his chains, as a result of his circumstances. In other words, he's fired up about what is going on in the lives of others and what is happening in terms of advancing the gospel of Christ. His attitude really was, you know what? This isn't about me. This is about the gospel. This is about what it can do in the lives of others. You, you see, Paul had joy because life from his perspective was not just about him. 
life was about advancing the gospel and it was about how it could bless others. That's where his joy came from. You know, Brother Hoyt, who's a former pastor here at Olivet, he used to talk about joy and he said, well, joy is putting Jesus first, others second, and yourself third. Now, honestly, that's a lot easier to say than it is to do. And I, and I think it's really hard for us because I think the default position for most of us when it comes to pain and it comes to suffering and it comes to difficulty and it comes to challenge, the default position for most of us is, well, poor, poor, pitiful me. I mean, that's kind of how we approach it. We, we, we don't really think about, well, what good can come out of this? I mean, you know, victim status has become so elevated in our culture that we've even seen people who create circumstances to make them look like the victim because it will get them more attention. The focus is, well, look at me. But Paul's attitude was, well, it's not really about me. Paul really wasn't concerned as much about what was happening to him as much about what was happening through him. And God was using his chains to impact the city of Philippi and even you and I today as believers. So let's write down this attitude. Attitude number one when it comes to my circumstances is this. I, I need to learn the discipline of focusing less on what's happening to me and instead focus more on what is happening through me. Now, I, I don't say that to minimize the chains or battles that some of you are facing and some of us are walking through. I mean, I know some of you are in chains right now. You, you might be battling sickness. You might be out of work. You, you might have a rebellious teenager that is causing crisis and pain in your home. There, there may be a parent with Alzheimer's or maybe you're fighting depression. And the truth is your chains are real. But let me tell you what else is real. What else is real is your choice of attitude. You can focus on the chains or you can focus on what God can do with your chains. I mean, you, you can focus on the problem or you can focus on God's purpose in the midst of the problem. I mean, you can choose to see only the mess or you can give your mess to God and let him make a message out of it. In fact, I wanna leave a verse here to encourage you. Notice Ephesians 3.20, it's on your outline. It says, now to him, now notice this, a God who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. So Paul said, listen, when it comes to my circumstances, he said, my attitude is I wanna focus on what God can do through me more than what is happening to me. But there's a second thing we, we see in this text is not, what, what is not only a proper perspective about my circumstances, but what is a proper perspective about my obstacles. In fact, notice what it says here beginning in verse 15. He says, to be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others, verse 17, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. Now, Paul's obstacles here were really his adversaries. I mean, when you read about Paul's ministry, it's clear not everyone was crazy about the Apostle Paul. I mean, he had enemies along the way. I mean, and that, you know, if you stay true to the gospel, not everyone is going to uh, applaud that. But in this case, there were people who had an attitude of competition towards Paul in terms of prominence and influence in the church, in the mission of Christ, especially in the church at Rome. Now, we don't know all of the details, but it might be that some of them thought, you know, while, while Paul is in prison, I'm gonna take advantage and use my influence and power in the church for myself. 
And here's what we know. They were trying to stir up trouble by trying to get position and undermining and discrediting Paul. Now, I want you to think about it for a minute. I mean, th there's a real circumstance here. I mean, what we know is that Christians were in Rome before Paul arrived there. The leaders of the church at Rome, for what we know, they had worked long and hard to establish the church there. They had poured their lives into the church. They had a vested interest in what was happening in the church at Rome. They were the ones that were looked up to. They were respected. They were called upon. And yet what happens is when Paul comes on the scene, apparently all the attention was directed towards him. Christians began to murmur and say, well, you know, Paul said this and Paul said that and pagans in the street, the street you know, discussed about this stranger who boldly proclaimed the gospel of Christ. And, and so Paul was getting all the press. Paul was getting all of the attention. And because of this, the leaders felt threatened by Paul. I mean, you know, they worked hard to strengthen their position of leadership. And yet their motive was not love for God. It was jealousy of the apostle Paul. They didn't want to exalt Christ. They wanted to exalt themselves. They really didn't want to make Christ's name known, but they wanted to make Paul miserable. And so, you know, how did Paul respond to those who were preaching the gospel out of envy and trying to make him more miserable? Well, notice what he says in verse 18. In fact, notice how he puts it. He said, what does it matter only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Now, you know, I, I hope you'll notice this perspective. In fact, this is an attitude number two, so I hope you'll get it. I mean, it's simply this. The attitude is, is this. Paul's saying, you know what? My attitude is a kingdom first attitude. So I must develop a kingdom first attitude. I mean, think of it. Basically, what was, what was Paul's response to those who were preaching Christ out of envy? He said, well, his response was, who cares, basically? Now, I, I want to be clear here. It is not that Paul didn't think that people's motives matter because they do. I mean, motives do matter, but what didn't matter to Paul was Paul. I mean, that really is the bottom line here. Some were promoting Christ while putting him down. And Paul said, that's fine. <laughs> you know, in other words, if you want to put me down and proclaim Christ, that's fine. As long as you are promoting the gospel of, of, of Jesus Christ. I mean, notice this for Paul, it really wasn't about his prominence. It wasn't about his ego. It wasn't about his organizational placement or his title or that he had fame. It was all about Jesus. Paul was happy now, instead of one person sharing Christ, Christians all over Rome were sharing Christ. So his perspective was, you know what? He had this kingdom first attitude. Now, I want you to think about that. How, how do you develop that? Now, I, I don't know what mess that you might be battling. What's the obstacle that you might be facing? Maybe it's a circumstance that you have created. Maybe truly, I mean, it's a circumstance that you're kind of a victim of. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's, it's this things that, that are happening in, in, in your life. And maybe it's a give and take circumstance. But what I would encourage you to do is stop for a moment. And, and, and I want you to really think, how can I deal with this obstacle in my life in such a way that I can give it to God with a kingdom first mindset? God, how can you use this for your glory? Not just how can I get out of it easily, not what's the easy way out, but how can, how can I live in a way that it, that it honors you? You know, I thought of Rick Warren, you know, he wrote the book, The Purpose Driven Life. And we've gone through that a couple of times as a body of believers. But the subtitle of that book is What on Earth Am I Here For? And we said this before, the first 
sentence of the first chapter on the first page, it is this. What God's purpose for life, what? It's not about you, is that statement. And uh, someone had asked Rick, Rick Warren about the book and it become a best-selling book. And his response was, well, when you write a book that has in the first sentence on the first page of the first chapter, it's not about you. He said, God has a way of showing you that it's definitely not about you. Well, that to me is exactly where Paul is. Paul was being criticized, he was being belittled, and he said, you know what, if Christ is exalted, then I'm gonna rejoice in that. Now, I, I think this requires us, and I know for me, to really take an attitude check. I mean, what, what, what is Paul's heart? Well, his, part, his heart is this, it is absolute selflessness for the things of God. I mean, I would just ask you, how selfless are you how selfless am I for the things of God? You know, it was Ronald Reagan that is well known for saying it is amazing how much you can accomplish if you don't uh, care who gets the credit. And you know, it, it really is about a selflessness, a kingdom first mindset that really is gonna be in a position that God can use us. See, the question is, what are we willing to give up in order to really see the kingdom of God move forward? You see, the truth is, if you are selfless when it comes to the things of God, then you are not going to miss out on being a part of the things of God. But if you are selfish, then you're going to miss out on what it is to really be a part of God's kingdom and his purpose. So what is a proper perspective when I'm facing trials and difficulty? Well, Paul would say a proper perspective on our circumstances is, well, hey, you know, focus more on what is happening through me than what's happening to me. And then what about obstacles? Paul would argue, well, you know what? We need to have a kingdom first mindset. How can this obstacle glorify God? Well, the last thought I would leave with you this morning is this. What is a proper perspective about myself? In other words, how do I see myself in the midst of the trials or difficulties of life? And uh, in fact, you, you know, Paul's attitude about himself is that when it comes to, to whether or not his life is honored, Paul said, well, you know, who cares? In other words, it seems to me Paul doesn't care if a school is named after him or if a building at a university is named after the Apostle Paul or a church is named after him. But when it comes to whether or not his life honors Jesus, Paul would argue that is everything. In fact, in verse 19, notice what he, what he put in the 19th verse. He said, because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul says here in verse 19 that this shall turn out for my salvation. Might be translated in uh, your translation, deliverance. I know it is in, in the NIV. But the, the word here in the Greek text is a form of the word salvation. He said, well, what, is, what does Paul mean? Well, you know, the word, the word here does not mean personal safety because in verse 21, the Apostle Paul says, well, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The, the word here literally doesn't mean salvation in the sense of eternal security or security with God because we're saved not by what we endure, but by what Christ has endured through his death, burial, and resurrection. We're saved not because of our suffering, but because of Christ's suffering. The word here really has the idea of personal well-being. So I want you to get this. In other words, God was going to work in Paul's suffering and Paul's chains and Paul's imprisonment to make him more like Jesus. In other words, to make him stronger, to make him better, to make him more equipped to be a follower of Jesus that would honor him.
In other words, Paul says, I'm going to embrace this suffering. Because I want this suffering to make me more like Jesus, better equipped to honor Jesus. Now, I got to tell you something. This really challenged me because, you know, I, I think that I often try to find ways to, to run from suffering. I, I, I think we, we often do that. We, you know, if you think about it, uh, America, sadly, has uniquely created this prosperity gospel which basically by definition demonizes suffering or struggling in, in this form. And, and yet the lessons of history, the lessons of scripture actually have taught us that great souls actually graduate from the school of suffering, from the school of conflict, never from really the school of ease and convenience and just a painless existence. While there is, you know, when there is no calamity, there's no courage. When there's no hardship, there's no hardness. When there's no stress, there's no strength. You know, Richard Baxter was a preacher in the 17th century. He really is one of history's more notable uh, preachers. But throughout his life, I mean, he was plagued by one illness after another. In fact, for many years, he would enter the pulpit really fearing that he might not leave it alive. One of his biographers said that his illness was the source of his greatness because it weakened temptation, it kept him from valuing the world too highly, and it taught him the importance of every moment of time. So my question would be, you know, what, what, what is your handicap? I mean, what, what, what is your unpleasant circumstance? What is it right now that causes you to suffer? I, I think the lesson here is, listen, don't bemoan those things. Instead, realize that God can use them to mold you into the person that he wants you to be. In fact, that's one of the incredible pictures of the biblical worldview is that God can use suffering in your life and mine for a greater good. I, I, I mean, you know, we can respond in anger and become bitter, or we can accept suffering and difficulty and trials and even crisis as really the chisel that God uses to sculpt marred sinners into saints. Paul's imprisonment was going to be an instrument that God used to make him more like Jesus. You know, again, I, I often think that, that most of us, I mean, our instinct is what? We want to run from difficulty. I mean, we've kind of developed a theology, I think, in North America that, you know, listen, if it's, it, it can't be God if it's something I don't want to hear. And it can't be God if I don't particularly like it. And it can't be God if it challenges me. I mean, it can't be God if it's not easy or convenient. I mean, you know, it can't be God if it doesn't affirm my opinions. It can't be God if it doesn't make me feel good. Or it can't be God if it causes me to step outside of my box. I mean, you know, that can't be God. And Paul is reminding us it may very well be God. That it may be God's agenda right now because his agenda is not necessarily to make us feel good, but it's to make us like Jesus. It is to live a life that is surrendered for the glory of God and his kingdom. In fact, I, I think if you had to summarize Paul's attitude, attitude number three about himself was this, whatever circumstance he was in, it would be this, Lord, help me to finish well. Lord, help me to finish well. In fact, notice what he says there in verse 20. In fact, he said, my eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now as always with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul's saying, listen, I, I wanna finish well. Now, you see, the truth is everyone listening this morning either is a problem, has a problem, or lives with one. And the truth is trials are going to come. Crisis are going to come into our lives. 
And you know, the truth about the real problems and the trials of life is this. You don't get perspective when you're in the storm. It is the perspective that you gain when you're outside of the storm that can lead you to really grow in the midst of the storm. A few weeks ago, uh, on a Sunday evening, I shared the story that I would heard Joel Gregory share years ago. Joel Gregory, uh, several years ago in the 80s, was a pastor of Travis Avenue Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. It was located very close to Southwestern Seminary. He had many, many seminary students that were a part uh, of that church. They were members there. He shared the story that one night his phone rang in the middle of the night. And he had discovered that the house of a young seminary couple had caught fire and burned to the ground. So he made his way quickly, as quick as he could to the house. And he said when he got there, he said the streets were blocked with emergency vehicles, fire trucks, there were news camera crews, there were floodlights. And as he made his way up to the house, someone told him, he said, Pastor, it, it's too late. And he said, what, what, what do you mean it's too late? I said, well, the, the husband had rushed back into the house to try to rescue their baby, very young baby, and he and the baby never made it out of the house. He was told that the young wife had been taken to a hospital emergency room. And so he said he immediately went to his car and began to drive to the emergency room. And he used to begin to think, Lord, what, what, what am I going to say? I mean, how, how do I pray? How do I share with her? In fact, you know, he said, why do you share with this young woman who has lost everything? I mean, what do you say? And he said, so he, he walked into the emergency room and he found her in one of those areas where the curtains had been drawn in the emergency room. And as he walked in and pulled back the curtain, he saw there her face was covered with soot. And he said, before I could say anything, he said, this young woman looked at me and said, Pastor, I will not make a decision about this right now, but here's what I know. I know that the Lord is the strength of my life. He said, I, I have never forgotten that. She said, immediately, the Lord is the strength of my life. He said, one thing I know about her, she didn't make that decision in the midst of that storm. She had made that decision many years ago. The Lord is the strength of my life. Now listen, what I'm talking about today in facing trials and crisis, this isn't about phony smiles or plastic halos. I mean, I'm sure that young woman felt sadness, doubt, fear, frustration, devastation, and incredible grief. But she was also consciously aware that her attitude, her spirit was a choice. And she said, you know what? I, I, I'm gonna choose to find my strength in Christ. It is this perspective in the midst of the trials. The Apostle Paul said, listen, that's how I'm going to filter the, the problems that I face in life. So I want to encourage you as we wind our study together, simply this. As you face your circumstances as a follower of Jesus, I would encourage you to take note from the Apostle Paul and begin to ask, God, what can you do through me instead of focusing on you know, just what's happening to me? As you battle your obstacles, I challenge you to begin to think, how can I have a kingdom first mindset? God, how can you use this for your glory in my life? As you think about yourself, think about how do I finish well? You can't change the past, but you can walk with God into the future. So let's learn from the Apostle Paul to find our strength in Christ and the gospel. Now, how do you do that? Well. You begin in a relationship with Christ. I always want to give this opportunity. If you're listening and have never received Christ as your Savior, I invite you to make that vital, eternal decision to turn from sin, place your faith in Christ. Jesus died 
on a cross for your sins. He was buried on the third day. He was raised from the dead. If you'll turn from your sin, place your faith in Christ, follow him. He will forgive you of your sins. He'll give you this gift of eternal life. Some of you may need to trust him as your savior. And we want to give you an opportunity. You can text in just a moment and we want to show you how you can know Jesus. Maybe you have some specific prayer needs. Maybe you're facing a trial and we can pray with you about that. Listen, I want to encourage you to do that. In fact, you might notice there on, on your screen, you can text today at Olivet BC to 81010 and uh, we'll text you back and, and uh, we will respond to any questions that you have. Or if you have a prayer request, you can text at Olivet Pray to 81010 and we'd love to pray with you. But well, let's close our time together with prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence here with us. Father, we thank you for the hope that's found in Christ. And God, I know many people are facing trials and difficulties. God, I pray that we would find our strength in you. May we learn from the Apostle Paul, Lord, to give this to you and allow you to work in our lives for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Again, thank you for worshiping with us at Olivet Baptist Church. We hope you have a blessed week this week, and our prayer is that you grow closer to God each and every time we meet together. We hope to see you real soon. Stay safe. We love you. God bless you, church, and have a great week.